Why don't we just sing a couple songs? Please. Sunshine, blessed sunshine, the peaceful, happy moments, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is in my soul today, and hope and Things that she gives me now for choice in future days. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine. The ice full, happy moments, happy moments roll when Jesus shows smiling face. There is sunshine in my soul. Amen. We could use some sunshine, couldn't we? Uh, Anybody tired of rain? A guy down the street from us, he's building this great big boat, and he came by and asked if we had a couple of dogs and a couple of cats and whatnot. (laughs) Anyway, it's been raining like crazy, but it's better than snow, right? It'll stop and it'll dry, but sunshine... And so aren't you glad you know the Lord tonight? Amen. Glad you're saved tonight and uh, you can rejoice in him. Father, we're thankful for this evening, thankful for this time. We can just come together and sing these songs to pray, to open up your precious word tonight and study it. We are so thankful today that we can have joy deep down in our heart. And we praise you tonight and give you all the glory and honor. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, another song.
First Thessalonians, as I said, we're going to do a study through on uh, Wednesday nights through the, Paul's letters to the churches. And we believe the first letter that Paul wrote uh, to the churches uh, was the, uh, the letter written to the church in Thessalonica. So we're going to look at that tonight and uh, pick it up and see where we're at. Where we're at. I think we were, uh, that was your first slide. Just kind of quickly go through these. Went through these last week. There's a map. We can see Thessalonica sits in what area? Macedonia. And this whole area today is known as something you put in your pan before you cook popcorn. Greece. Greece, right? Or butter. Somebody's going to say coconut oil. But uh, the area of Greece, right? Uh, up above this, of course, is now Turkey, uh, was Asia Minor, over in this, this area here, Asia Minor, now it is Turkey. So you have to almost have a map of today and a map back then to figure out what was what. Was what. We looked at the, uh, some of the archaeological digs and things that were done there, the, uh, the Colosseum. Um, if you ever get a chance someday, what a great trip this would be to uh, uh, that area and see what's left of these churches. In these cities, by the way, is Thessalonica still in existence today? Yes. Absolutely, second largest city in Greece. So we see Paul's travels. Is Paul would travel, uh, make numerous journeys in this one. He would travel the King's Highway here uh, by foot and head over to Thessalonica. We talked about the Roman rule last week. We talked about their government. And uh, Karen, you talk about my hair starting to curl. At least it didn't look like these guys, right? And, uh, wow, there's a head of hair. But uh, uh, Claudius had made some decisions. We looked at that. The letter was written again between 50 and 52 A.D., just 20 years after Christ's crucifixion. Uh, again, possibly the first epistle written outside of maybe Galatians, but we believe Thessalonians was written first to that church. And uh, it was even written before the Gospel of Mark. Uh, the earliest of the Gospels was actually penned to paper. So we see these things, went over these last week, and uh, Paul would thank them in this text for their, their zeal and their faithfulness, and we're going to move right on into tonight's message and the, uh, the fact that these Christians uh, were workers. I believe one reason I want to look at the churches is I want us to see what happened in the example, because you know, the example in churches today is, 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 is crazy. I mean, it's like uh, people come in and want to know, do you have a softball league? Do you have a tennis league? Do you have a golf league? Do you have... No, but we teach the Bible, right? And uh, they want to know what songs you sing. I thought we preached the Bible, right? So uh, how did those first churches react? And how were the, the, the people? Was it simply a, a one man got up and preached and it was a one man show? Or uh, was everybody involved in those first churches? So from the beginning... Uh, Actually, every member of the church was encouraged to be uh, really in with a full program, the whole program of the church. It's interesting. We, we see folks who over the years will get a ministry, and that will be their ministry, but they won't get involved in anything else. Yet actually, we're called as a body, we're called a community. And, uh, you know, the word church came in, it means, its Greek phrase is ekklesia, which means a, a gathering together, and as, as we know, is a gathering together of born-again believers. So this would be an ecclesia here tonight, our body of believers that are here. But these churches would form communities. And a community is just a, a gathering of, of like people, whatever that, whatever that might be. We use, see that term used in, in different ways. Uh, I live in a 77-home uh, uh, subdivision. And thanks to my beloved wife, I get to be the president of the subdivision. And uh, I'm the one that gets to go to the door and say, you haven't paid your dues yet. And uh, so anyway, I've got one family, a new family moved in. I went to see them today uh, to give them information and whatnot. But we are a community. And they asked, they said, well, can we come to the meetings? I said, they are, absolutely, this is a community. We all are equal here. I have a position to take care of this, but I am no better than anybody else in this community. And we all come together. And the more people that come together and help make decisions, the better the decisions are. And the more people will, 
will, will, will become part of that decision that's made. And that, that's how the church was supposed to be, and that's how the church is still supposed to be. No matter what your ministry is in the church, you're part of the community. You're part of the family, right? It's like maybe you had a job at home, maybe your job was to mow the grass. I hit a rock one day with my dad's lawnmower, and he came out and said, you'll never mow the grass again. I thought, wow, I should hit that rock earlier. But uh, anyway, my job was to mow the grass, and my, my mom did sewing and cleaning, and, and my brother... I don't know what he did. Anyway, but, uh, you know, we all had jobs to do, right? But we all ate dinner together, and we all talked together. We watched gun smoke together or those things because we were a community. We were a family that worked together. And if you pull one thing out of all of this, when you look at the church in Thessalonica, Colossae, Galatia, uh, Ephesus, you're going to find churches that were really communities really working together and God would bless abundantly in those churches. I mean, the, the fruits that came forth from those churches was tremendous. Can somebody name me a church that didn't work very well as a community? I didn't mention them, but they are in the scriptures. And they start with a C and they're south of, of Thessalonica. And there were two letters written to them, possibly three letters, but two in the Bible. What was it? Corinth, the city of Corinth, the church, the Corinthian church was not a united body and Paul had to come in and write, he wrote actually three letters, uh, one was his own personal letter, the other two were inspired by God and uh, we have those in our Bible, but had to, through God's power, bring these people and bring them into unity of the spirit so that they could serve God and uh, we, we see that tonight, so we think of, a, think of it as a, a community, an ecclesia, a called out. These folks we see here in Thessalonica, we'll see some other verses tonight, are the ones that were saved uh, back on Paul's journey, back in Acts, or, yeah, Acts chapter 17. So we see that as he was moving through and, and preaching the gospel. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith, your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak any thing. So he speaks about their, their work and their toil and their endurance to just keep going. There were difficult times back then, difficult times to, to preach the gospel, to share. And, and these were all new believers. I mean, Picture a church that nobody had been through the Bible Institute yet. Nobody had been away to Bible college. Nobody had their cemetery degree yet, right? These were people who gathered together, right? Christ had died some 20 years before. Paul had come through and, and led people to Christ. Maybe some had, had come up from or over from Jerusalem. And, but well, regardless of the case, none of them were well versed in scriptures because the New Testament wasn't even written yet. So they were all babes in Christ, you know, and babes have trouble taking care of babes. I, one day I was put in charge of watching Amber and Tiffany. I think one was two and the other was one. Uh, not only 49 weeks apart. And their mom and Karen and uh, I guess they all went out somewhere and left me home to babysit. And, and we were watching, what was the show? Aristocrats. The Aristocrats. What a great show that is. And they came in and and the, uh, the one-year-old was changing the two-year-old's diaper. And their mom says, Grandpa, what are you doing? I says, we're watching Aristocats. Do you see what they're doing? Yeah, they're doing a great job, right? And uh, I wasn't paying much attention to, to what I should be doing, but it was a, a babe trying to take care of a babe. And I guess they needed a mature adult, so I waited till Grandma got home to take care of that. But uh, seriously... When we look at this church and we see all that they were going through and we understand that these weren't people who had been believers for 40 or 50 or 60 years. They weren't second or third generation. They were first generation believers who were excited about their faith. It says they, in that verse 8, they said they sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only where they were in Macedonia, but in, in Achaia and, and any place they went. Could you imagine today if that church would have had all the tools that we have today? Wow. 
gospel tracks and DVDs and all those kind of things and all that. You know, all they had, and maybe, maybe it was a good thing, all they had was their personal testimony and they went out and told others that Jesus saves. What do you mean Jesus saves? Well, all I know is here's what happened to me. I was lost and I, I, I talked to this man about what Jesus did. I trusted him and now I'm saved. And I'm going to heaven. I'm going to glory. And remember, many of these that were being saved, there were many Jews there that were being saved. There was a a, a temple there in, in uh, Thessalonica. We know that because Paul went and preached in the temple. There were Jews being saved and, and, and family members. Oh, it, was, it had to be awful that you put your faith in that, that cultic Jesus. And how could you do that? And, and now you're not allowed back in the temple. You're, you can't come to any of our dinners. You can't come to this and do that. They were difficult times. But he says here that they everything was spread abroad. He says... We, we need not to speak anything. You've, you've done our work for us. You have taken care of everything. I want to see three things that they had as we go through this. And again, there's no rush on this. And if you have comments or thoughts, uh, we'll make it more like a Bible study. Uh, you raise your hand and you, you shout it out and we'll go from there. But I believe they had three things. They had faith, they had love, and they had hope. You want a foundation to build something. Look at uh, verse 5 of chapter 1. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in the power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as we know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. They listened. They received the word of God. They listened with an, with an open heart. The word was preached to them simply, sincerely, sacrificially. You know, we were out to breakfast today with a pastor friend of ours, and uh, uh, Karen brought up years ago Dr. James Kennedy out of uh, Presbyterian Church down in Florida started a program called Evangelism Explosion. Anybody hear of it? Evangelism Explosion. Uh, it was a just a small, thin book like this, and... I came across it, the church we were at, uh, Calvary Baptist did not have any type of organized uh, visitation program. So I came across this book and I presented it to uh, one of the assistant pastors, uh, Bronson, and said, you know, we ought, to, we ought to teach this and start some type of organized visitation. So we did, that was a small little book and it had some ideas on, on how to lead people to Christ and questions to ask, it was really very, very good. Um, the Lord would move us away a few years after that down to Ohio for 15 years and we'd come back and by this time the church had moved to another location. We came back and now all of a sudden this little book like this was now a like six month course or three year course on how to lead people to Christ and uh, uh, I guess I kind of rubbed them the wrong way a few times but I said I don't think I need, we, we started this thing. But I asked one of their people to come in and I had a little class of uh, people who wanted to know how to lead people to the Lord and, and uh, they didn't like that because they wanted to have them all in their class. And I said, well, you know, these are folks who can't come to the class, but they still need to know how. So I asked one of the men to come in and, and uh, I would say his name was Glenn, okay? And I said, Glenn, I want you to come in and I want you to lead me to Christ, right? You're going to listen to what I say and all I want you to do is lead me to Christ to show them how to do it, to go through your Bible. So he came in, and he knocked on my door, and I said, hello. He says, well, I'm, I'm Glenn. I'm from New Life Bible Baptist Church. We use this place here. And, uh, oh, boy, you know, I am so glad you're here. I have been searching and searching for an answer to life, and uh, I've heard some things about Jesus, and I, I want to get saved tonight. I really do. Was it an hour later? An hour later, I still wasn't saved. I was being asked question after question after question. I mean, what I wanted to do is say, you know something? If that's what I need to do to be saved, I don't want to be saved, right? There's a simplicity that's there. Somebody comes up and says, I, I want, and, and that's like fishing in a, a fish tank, right? You know, I, I want to be saved. Can't we just open our Bible? Say, well. Here we are, you know, we've all sinned, uh, Romans 3.23, right? We've all sinned, come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not one, right? 
over to Romans chapter 5, and for one by one man, Adam sinned and in the world and death by sin, so we've all sinned. So do you agree that you've sinned? You ever done anything wrong? Yes, I have. Then great. Well, understand today that we can't get to heaven if we, if, if we have sin because sin can't enter into heaven, but Jesus Christ came, and the Bible tells us that uh, he offers us the gift of salvation. He came and died on that cross for you and for me, right? We have no right into heaven, but because he was God in human flesh, he offered himself a sacrifice that if we would put our faith and trust in him, believe in him with all our heart, that we could be saved and enter into heaven's glory, right? The gift of God is eternal life. And uh, Romans, you know, you go to Romans uh, uh, 10, 9 and 10, for the mouth man confess, you know, believe it, and for the heart, man believeth unto salvation with the mouth. Confession is made unto sin. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you like to call on the name of the Lord today? Well, yes, I would. Wonderful. I'd like you just to bow your head. And would you just call to Jesus, however that might be, and ask him to save you today, right? And I want them to pray. Now, that took, what, about two minutes, right? Very simple. I didn't get into the significance of the knot holes in Noah's Ark, Right? I didn't get into uh, uh, the uh, creation as far as uh, uh, the Big Bang or biblical uh, creation or whatever, anything like that. It was simple. And I believe as we're talking to people, it needs to be simple. Because that's who God brings to us. There are people that you're going to meet and, and, and they want to argue. I don't argue with people. Are you coming because you want to get saved? Do you want to know the truth? Or are you just coming to argue because I don't have time to argue? Because for every one of you, there's 20,000 out there, right? So anyway, it's, it's a simple thing. How many think they could do that with somebody? Just read them in Christ. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. You know, learn how to do that. You know, take your Bible. The first thing I did is I took my Bible, and I, in, in front of my, my, my first Bible, my Ryrie Study Bible, I have uh, the verses on, you know, how to lead somebody to Christ, eternal security, baptism, just some basics so that, if I run into somebody, I can go in the front of my Bible and I can go right through how to do that. Simple, right? Simple. That's what we need to be able to do. So anyway, this church, as Paul preached, it was a, a simple thing. We would say they had a, 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 a simple faith. The, the word was preached. Look at uh, chapter 2. We read these first 11 verses. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain not worthless, in other words. But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at, at Philippi. We were bold in our, our, our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with, with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we, took, as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of, of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her child, children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because ye were dear unto us. You see the compassion, everything that was laid there? For we remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses in God also how holy and how justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that we would walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and his glory. It says they received, drop down to verse 13, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, 
which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Their hearts were open. They came in faith. How were people saved in the Old Testament? Were they saved by works? How were they saved? They were saved by faith. They looked forward to the coming Messiah. They looked forward to that one promised in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. They looked forward. They didn't fully understand how this would happen, but they had faith in God. They believed God. Right? Abraham, he, was, he believed God and it was counted unto him. Righteousness, right? So we, we understand they came by faith. How were they saved in the New Testament days? By faith. by faith. How are we saved today? By faith, by faith right? We live a life that's by, by faith. The just shall live by faith, we're told. So they had, they had faith. They had faith in Christ. They had a faith that went beyond maybe the understanding of, of their family and friends and coworkers, but they had a faith. They had a hope in the future now. They, they had a, a blessed hope. The Bible says that uh, we're to look for the coming of our blessed hope. Who is who? Jesus Christ coming back, right? Our blessed hope. Our hope isn't a wish. You know, maybe you, uh, um, I, I should ask these. Did you all get everything you wanted for Christmas? Just say yes. Okay, even if you didn't. But, you know, so we don't always get what we want for Christmas, right? And uh, we, we want this, we want that. And there were some things I wanted. I wanted to go away to hockey school, and I wanted my parents to pay for that. And I don't know, it was like $700 back in 1965. That's a lot of money, right? And uh, so I didn't get that. I think I got a basketball, uh, which was close. But uh, we don't always get. Those are wishes. We make a wish that that would happen. Your hope is not a wish. Your hope is a confirmed event that's going to happen. We have hope in Christ. That hope is that he will take care of all things. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He promised us an abundant life, and he will see to it because the promises of God are yea and amen, the scriptures say, right? So if we read that and look through that, these folks had they had a hope, and they had a love, not only for, for others, but they had, a, they had a love for the lost. And sometimes I think we, we lose that in Christianity. You know, we forget the pit from which we'd been digged. And uh, if we have a love for, for, for someone else, we're going to share with them the things of Christ. And that's what they did. They, they lived by faith. They lived by hope. They lived by love. And uh, that's what they did. They were uh, uh, Christian uh, workers here. They had the example of Paul and Silas and, and, and Timothy, as we read there at the beginning in verse 1. You know, they came in and dropped down to verse 6 of chapter 1. And ye became followers of us. Wow. You know, parents, grandparents, your kids and grandkids kind of follow what you do. What do we say? Your, your walk talks and your talk talks? But your walk talks louder than your talk talks, right? You know, the things we do are the things that our children do and our grandchildren do. And, and we need to live a life of example. You know, you two now are working out in the world. You have a job somewhere and people are watching you two. I went there and uh, one of the workers were there and he introduced himself, and I said, ah, oh, that's who you are. And it was, I was being funny, okay, which I do sometimes. And he goes, oh, no. <laughs> it was like, well, what did I do, right? And I, or he knows what I did. I said, I'm just kidding, okay. You know, it, it, everything's been good, they said. But the point is this, that, that we need to be examples, not only to those that we're right with, but for those who are watching us, right? Have you ever been in a situation when you did something and you thought, well, that was pretty bad for my testimony. Don't raise your hand, okay? Because every hand would go up. You know, our, our attitude or something that we did. But we need to be examples, not perfect. None of us are perfect. But we need to be examples and realize that what we say and do and the thing, places we go, the things we watch, things we hear, we need to be examples to our children, to our grandchildren, to coworkers, to all those that are around us. Paul, Silas, Timothy, 
all three of these in, in chapter 1, verse 1, that, that are there as they come in, you know, they lived a life in front of them that was an example of how to live for Christ, an example of what it meant to be a, a, a child of Christ. They saw men not just doing a job, but they saw men that actually cared and loved them as we, we read through that text of scripture that they, they came and presented the, uh, the gospel, but also our own souls because he says, uh, ye were dear unto us in verse eight. In a church community, we all need to be dear unto each other. Now, what's the term you use? Prickly pears, right? Some people are like prickly pears and they're, yeah, they're kind of hard to get along with sometimes, right? And uh, fortunately, none, nobody here would be hard to get along with it at any time, right? But uh, we have that, but we're, we're called to love them. It's like having children. You know, my daughter has six, my son has 12, and, and some are more prickly than others. And, uh, you know, so you're, but you, you love them all. And they, parents have to love them all in, in each way. In a community, in a church community, it's our responsibility to be c concerned about everybody. I love our remind that I can send out. Because I can send out prayer requests. And know that you folks are, are reading those and praying for those people, thinking about those people. If you don't get those reminds, if you didn't get a few this week on Boyd's brother Jerry, please see me. Make sure we have the right phone number in there for you. And... Uh, but you get those, they're, they're short. I, I like them because you know, if you've ever done Messenger and you send out a message and people start responding, you just, you get everybody's response. With this one, I send it out. If you respond back, it only comes to me. So it's uh, more private that way. I like that. But anyway, the point is that, uh, that there's an example that's there. They, they worked tirelessly for what they did. Now, I'll be, be honest with you, I mean, I, most of the people I went to school with today are retired, right? They're traveling somewhere or they're, they're dead or wherever they are, but uh, they're not working anymore, right? And I keep doing it. Why? Because I love the Word of God and I love you and I, I want you to know the Word of God and, and, and to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. There's plenty of time to rest after he takes me home, right? But listen... We need to, to do it tirelessly and, and keep going. Uh, it, it, it's good to get some help uh, and do that because I have found that uh, I don't have the energy. Anybody else that get a little older don't have the energy you used to have, right? But, uh, you know, what, what they're looking for here, and I think what's so important to realize is that God's not looking for weekend warriors. You know, they used to call the National Guard people that. That was the term given to those because they would go and serve on the weekend. Uh, I think they're much more than that. They're in battle nowadays and they're being used so much and they're, they're wonderful folks. But, uh, you know, sometimes we think our only job at church is just show up on Sunday or, or do this or do that and, and we're done. But as believers, our job is 168 hours a week. It's 24-7. We're not a weekend warrior. We're in the Lord's army and we're called to serve. And that's how this, this first church was. Paul thanked them for their love and their benevolence for others. They loved each other greatly. Look at uh, Romans 15, 26. Romans 15 and verse 26. Romans 15, verse 26. You see, this, these folks in Thessalonica became part of the collection for those in Jerusalem. Remember, the, the church in Jerusalem was under tremendous pressure financially. And uh, uh, it says, verse 26, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. So he's writing here to the church um, in Rome, and he's writing to them and telling them, look at those folks over in, in Greece and Macedonia and uh, Achaia, they also gave to help the church down there in Jerusalem. Now, Thessalonica was not a, a wealthy church, but they, they took care of things, and Aristarchus and Secondus, messengers of the church, picked up that collection and would take it uh, 
uh, with them down to Jerusalem in, in Acts chapter 20 and, and verse 4. I think we look at this, we see Paul characteristics of, of giving cheerfully and liberally were, were demonstrated in, in, to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and, and, and verse 1. So he's, he's living by example, giving what he has. And uh, I think they saw him put some things in the offering plate to give as well. They, 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 they did what they were supposed to do. They encouraged, they gave as part of that, that uh, uh, gift that was supposed to be given. And uh, I don't know if you can read this up there. I, you can't read it. I can't read it. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, so built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together onto the hall, uh, for the people had a mind to work together. Remember the rebuilding of the wall in Jerusalem and Nehemiah and Ezra's day? They had a mind to work together. And I want to encourage our church and, and maybe other churches that are listening to this message that our, our bodies, our, our ecclesia, our communities work together. I'm not calling for uh, a big ecumenical movement. I'm just saying, look, at our church as a church needs to work together, right? We need to understand that this is a, a body that needs every part of it to be functioning. They, they, uh, they edified one another. They lifted up one another. That's what that means. And uh, look at uh, uh, chapter 5, verses 11, back in 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 5, and look at verses 11 through 14. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. In other words, you're edifying. Keep doing it. Keep lifting up each other. Right? You know, it's, it's funny sometimes to, to joke about somebody, but you got to be careful what you do and when you do it and who you do it to and what you're doing. And, but our job is to lift up each other, right? To encourage each other. To say, hey, you can, you can do this. I, I'd love to see more people get, take part in our, our Faith Bible Institute. We're down to, I think, four people in that. And I don't know if we're going to be able to continue it or not. Um, I'm hoping we can, but what a great way to learn your Bible and to, to really just... Get in there and learn it. It's not hard. You don't have to take the tests. You don't have to do all those things. Just get in and learn it and, and do it at your own pace. And uh, what, a, what a joy it is. To, but I want to encourage people. My, my goal is to encourage everyone to know their Bible inside and out so that you can know the Lord in a very intimate, intimate way. So he talks here to him in verse 12. And, and, and we beseech you. That word beseech means to beg. We beseech you. Anybody think of another place that word is used? Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and, and admonish you. And stop here for a second. We need to know everybody, Right? I know some folks, some folks have trouble introducing themselves to other people, right? And uh, I don't have that problem. My wife doesn't have that problem. These guys don't have that problem. But, you know, introducing ourselves and getting to know, and typically it's the job of those who are here to get to know those who are coming in. Uh, I, I find it a joy over the years. You know, we've had a lot of people come. We've we buried a lot of people. A lot of people moved and, and, and whatnot. But to get to know folks and get to, to understand and, and learn their life and, and to learn the stuff they've been through in life and maybe how they grew in Christ, how they got saved, where they served and, and other things that happened in their life. You get to know each other. And that's what he's telling them. Get to know each other. There was a day and time when, when people readily invited other church members over to their house for just a, a dessert or a, a visit or whatever, and people will go back and forth like that. And it, it was a great time. It seems to have just kind of died off other than maybe a couple little clicks here and there. We need to see that. And he says, so this, this first church, he, he encourages here in Thessalonica to, to get to know those people, not just know their names. I, I'm amazed sometimes. There'll be, there'll be people, and they've been here for, for years. I say, oh, I, well, you know such and such. No. Now listen, folks, we're not a church of 
2,000 people, right? It's, is it really hard to get to know everybody's name? Right? But we need to be doing that. We need to know. We need to know each other because you'll never know when God will put somebody in your life that you can help. They're going through a struggle and God brings them here. You see, the Lord adds to the church. We don't add to it. The Lord adds to it, according to Acts chapter 2. That someone come and they can, they can grow and they can be helped. That's our job. So this first church, if we look at it, they're being encouraged that uh, uh, they would be watch and be careful over the other saints. Last part of verse 13, and to esteem them very highly in love. Whoa. Not only just to meet them and learn their name, but to love them, to actually care about them, to care about what's going on. And uh, uh, if it be somebody going in for surgery or whatever it is, or homesick, a, a phone call, I think we're going to be held accountable when we get to heaven for all the communication we didn't do, right? I mean, we can text, we can voicemail, we can email, we can make a phone call, we can send a card. We have a hundred ways of communicating. Most people don't pick up on 99 and a half of them. So he says here in his church, and again, the, the example here, to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, for, for whatever they're doing, and, and, and be at peace among yourselves. They say that Christians are the only army that shoot their wounded, right? Somebody falls into sin and everybody just jumps on them and, uh, ah, I knew they were going to do that. I knew they were going to fall. I knew that was going to happen. Be careful. You might be next, right? So we need to be careful. He says, but we had to live at peace among yourselves. Trust me, in the 22 years of our church, we haven't always had peace. Sometimes I've had to be the... Uh, uh, the one to step in to stop the war, right? And uh, it's usually a battle between folks. I, I, I think in the, the years, a few decades we've been here, I've only had a couple people really get upset about doctrine or the Bible that we use. Most of the time, it's personalities that become abrasive to another personality or they get jealous, whatever it is. Those things, according to what Paul is telling the church in Thessalonica, need to be set aside and to be at peace among yourselves. And now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded. I love that, okay? I'm glad God's called others to comfort me. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. And he gives them a series of things they ought to be doing. But do you see what he's doing? He's, he's encouraging them. He's encouraging them to, to keep doing what you're doing. Drop back to chapter 3. Look at verse 6. Verse 6, chapter 3. We're going to read through verse uh, uh, verse 13 here, chapter 3. Actually, I want 2 Thessalonians, I'm sorry. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3. I got laser, now I see better. Okay, look at 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 6. Here we go. Now we command your brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye with, withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and after the tradition which he, which he received, and, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. What did Paul do? to earn money. What did he do? He worked. What kind of work did he do? He made tents. He was a tent maker by trade. And uh, he would make tents. So when he'd come into a city, he made sure he didn't have to ask money from anybody. He just made tents and, and sold tents to folks. Right? Not because you have not power, but to, to make ourselves an example unto you, to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, 
neither should ye eat. Boy, there's a, a great one for today, isn't it? Yep. All right? We have a, a socialistic government now that if you don't eat, don't, if you don't work, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll give you money and lots of money, millions of dollars of money if we have to, to, to take care of you. Now, I understand there are times it's good to take care of folks, but I believe if someone has the ability to work, they ought to work. Remember the gentleman here that was, he was a, a drywaller. And uh, his poor wife, I don't know, they have three or four kids, if I know who I'm talking about. But, you know, she had to go to the unemployment place and she collected the unemployment checks and, you know, and got little odd jobs cleaning and whatnot. And I, I asked one day, so what did your husband do? He's a drywaller. Oh, he should make good money. Yeah, they can make his back then. He said, twenty-five dollars an hour. I said, so why do you have to go down and collect? Or he's not working. I said, he's not a drywaller. He's unemployed. I says, why doesn't he get a job drywalling? Well, because nobody wants to pay him twenty-five dollars an hour. I kind of looked at her. I said, well, where do they want to pay him? Well, like fifteen or twenty dollars an hour. So. 40 hours a week at $20, that's $800, that's $41,000 a year. I don't know, wouldn't that help? Well, he just doesn't want to work. And eventually they left and moved down, down south somewhere. But the point is, you know, he's speaking to him that we, we ought to be working, ought to be doing it. It says, uh, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. If any man obey not our words by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed at count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother." In other words, to encourage him and to tell them. And I, I've had people, I've made that comment I just made. I've had people come in up to after church and, and just uh, tear me out about, you know, you know well, we, he can't work or they can't work or whatever it is. Uh, that's between you and them. The point what he's making here is that there are those that are weak. Some are rebellious. Some don't want to work. But we are not to make enemies out of them. We are to go to them and speak to them and help them uh, to grow. So we see this tonight, we see this church. I'm going to pick this up next week in message number three. And uh, I think we, uh, I didn't do that, did I? Sorry. Okay. They were benevolent and they were encouragers. And as we move forward here at New Life Bible Baptist Church, everyone here ought to desire to pick up on, if you're not doing it already, to pick up on those characteristics of that first church because God would lead thousands and thousands to Christ because there was a church that was doing exactly as he called them to do. And the blessings come when we're obedient to God, when we're doing what he wants us to do. Paul didn't tell anybody here in the church of Thessalonica to not do anything but really just love other people and care for other people and you know, share the gospel with the lost and, 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 and admonish and encourage those that are, are wayward to help those that are hurting. It's the call that we're supposed to do. We'll pick up on this next week as we get to our third message in this text. With Stan, we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for this evening together. And Lord, what an example we have in this church in Thessalonica. The importance of this uh, all being a, a, of one, of knowing each other, of helping each other, of being there for each other, that we may encourage and exhort one another. And Lord, sometimes it's necessary to, to go to a brother or sister in Christ and to, to speak to them about something that's there in their life and to, to go with love and, and not accusations, but to help. Lord, help us to be, to be wise tonight. Help us to be tender towards others. Help us to be uh, thoughtful of those that are lost and need Christ. And we thank you for these that have come tonight. Thank you for those that will listen to this or have listened already. And Lord, we just pray now that you'll just uh, receive all the glory of all we do this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
and we will see you Sunday.